Hello, um, welcome to this third revision session for our um, A2 business studies. Um, if you're new to these sessions, my name's Alan Thomas and I'm a business studies teacher at Lindelois High School. Um, so far, we've covered the vast majority of Unit 3. We're going to finish off the final bits of Unit 3 today and then start on looking at some of the stuff from Unit 4. OK, so I'm just going to fire up the, uh, the PowerPoint and start going through each aspect. OK, so last thing we're looking at in Unit 3 is Chapter 10. We're looking at special orders. OK, now essentially it's looking at what special orders are, OK, evaluating whether special orders are accepted or not. OK, I think the best way to maybe go through this is to go through um, an example. OK, so a special order would, would be where it's outside your normal um, outside your normal orders where it be like um, do, doing it cheaper, ad ad adopting a design, a one-off um, one-off relationship, one-off one-off order. OK, um, so it might be modified, it might be um, lower prices, something something along those lines. So I'll go through an example for you. OK, first thing before we go through it, you need to just make sure we know some of the formulas. OK, so it's the, we, we should know what contribution is because we've done break even at GCSE and AS level. OK, so contribution is selling price for one, take away the variable cost for one. OK, so we need to need, need to make sure we do that. Now, if you want to have the total contribution, it's the contribution multiplied by the item sold. So if the contribution is two pounds and you sold um, 100 items. The total contribution is 200 pounds. Two is the contribution multiplied by the 100 items sold. OK, so this example, R&J Limited, manufacturer of headboards, OK, produces 3000 headboards a month, which are sold fifth. Um, sold to independent readers fifty pounds, then they sell on to customers for ninety pounds. Okay, RNJ Limited achieved revenue of one hundred fifty thousand per month. That's three thousand times fifty pounds. Okay, so that's they sell three thousand at fifty pounds. The costs include fixed cost of seventy thousand per week and variable cost of twenty pound per headboard. Okay, so the total variable cost is three thousand multiplied by twenty. Okay. Taking all this information to account, the profit of 20,000 achieved. I'll go take you through the figures here now. So as you can see there, the units are 3,000. The selling price is 50. You've got a variable cost of 20 pounds and fixed cost of 70,000 pounds. OK, so the total revenue is going to be 3,000 multiplied by 50. So that means our total revenue is 150,000. OK. Then we look at our total variable cost, which is 60,000, which is the 3,000 units multiplied by a 20 pound. Um, that is the variable cost for one. OK, and then you've got your fixed cost of 70,000. OK, so that means our total cost, which is our total variable cost plus our total fixed cost of 130,000, meaning that our total revenue, 150, take away our total cost, which is 130, gives us a profit of 20,000. Moving on from that, then the business has a capacity to produce 4,000 headboards. It's only producing 3,000 right now, so it has a spare capacity of 1,000. OK, so a business is now approached by a large retailer with an order for 1,000 headboards. This large retailer offers it a £35 per headboard with the intention of selling it on for £60. OK, so offering a £35 per headboard as opposed to £50 per headboard. OK, should R&J Limited accept the special order based on lower offer made? Now, first of all, we want to look at the quantifiable um, issues here. So we need to look at we need to look at it financially to begin with. OK, so if we look at this, so we look at 1000 units. OK, we're going to sell it on for 35 pounds per one. OK, so the revenue from the special order is going to be 1000 multiplied by 35 pounds. So the revenue from the special order is going to be 35,000. So the income that we've got coming in, the variable cost has remained the same. OK, all right. So the variable total variable cost is going to be um, 20,000. OK, so that's 1000 multiplied by the 20 pounds. OK, that means it leaves us with a profit of 15,000 pounds. So the revenue from the special order is 35,000. Take away the variable cost, which is 20,000. So purely from a financial basis. It would be a good idea to accept this order. OK, all right. That kind of just goes through it. So um, how does this add to our monthly profits? OK, so if we'd accept the order, 
OK, what we'll be looking at is our profit would increase from um, 20,000 to 35,000. OK, so it would be a good idea in order to, to, to take on this order. OK, all right. So this would be the bottom line figure. OK, so our total variable cost have gone up from 60 to 80,000. OK, our revenue has gone up from 150 to 185. Total fixed cost has remained the same because fixed costs remain the same regardless of output. So our total costs have gone up from 130,000 to 150,000. OK, however, it means our total profit has gone up from 20,000 to 15,000. So again, purely financial basis, it is a good idea to do so. However, there are a few um, things to take into consideration here. OK, um, the capacity can be met, all right, but is that going to, is that pushing your labour demand to the absolute maximum? OK, is it going to require maybe additional overtime? Are you going to maybe have to pay people for some extra overtime? Are you, are you going to maybe demotivate your workforce by going, right, OK, instead of like doing 3,000 3, comfortably, you're going to work them really hard and make sure they're doing 4,000, OK? It's also maybe important to consider is whether to accept it or not. Are you likely to get future orders from this business? If you are, it might be worth doing it. If it is a one off order, OK, and there are other factors to be considered, is if it's a one off order, maybe it's not worth doing so. OK, because what it might do is it might frustrate your existing customers. OK, so if your um, existing customers are seeing that you are offering it to a retailer for a cheaper price, then they, they might get frustrated. OK, well, I'm paying 50. You're allowing this person to pay 35. OK, I now want my goods at 35 pounds. So you might end up frustrating them. OK, um, also, you're going to be, you know, this large retailer is now selling their headboard at 60 pounds, OK, where the other, the, the, your old customers are selling it for 90 pounds. So essentially, you are allowing this large retailer to undercut your existing customers, which is going to frustrate them even more. Are they going to, is accepting this extra order going to mean you're going to lose customers in the following month or the month, months, months after that? So that's worth taking consideration whether you take on a special order or not. Is it going to be a big faff? to um, adjust your product. OK, so that's also worth taking into consideration. OK, right. So we're moving on now, OK, um, to unit four, business in a changing world. Now, there are six units you've looked at, OK, but a seventh one has been taken out. OK, just like Brexit, we have um, left the European Union, OK, on this one. All right. So we're looking at change, risk management, pest factors, ethical, legal, environmental factors, international trade and globalisation. OK, a lot of these you, you would have come up doing your GCSEs. OK, um, maybe if you studied geography, particularly the last two, OK, international trade and globalisation, you're probably aware of what pest factors are. OK, but if we move on, OK, this first unit um, on change, OK, is probably one of the more businessy ones. OK, as opposed to the other ones, a slightly more kind of economic, political, that kind of that kind of thing. All right. So. First of all, we're going to look at different kinds of things that can impact change, be it internal or external. OK, what is the difference between say planned and unplanned change? OK, and then different models that go along with maybe effectively dealing with change. OK. So. Um, We'll move on from this one. So different kinds of change, the ones from inside the business and um, ex outside the business. Internal, we would say that they are initiated by the business. OK, so you could have a change in ownership. Your business has become much larger. You change your vision or your mission objectives. OK, your workforce is changing and you're or you're transforming how your business is run. You're looking at how, how leadership is structured. OK. Then there, are, then there are there is change that you might not be able to um, to impact to to uh, to have an influence on. OK, so new competitors enter um, new government imposed new laws and regulations on the market you work in different economic changes, huge economic changes going on right now. Maybe you've seen the budget today, but it's definitely going to be worth having a look at and what the impact of that's going to be. Consumer tastes and trends. OK, you can't really influence what's going to be in fashion or not. What's the technological change? What? aspect what where are you what um technologies your customers getting access to okay what environmental changes out there depending on the market that you work in okay 
So um, you, you might sort of put the external ones more like, uh, you probably maybe categorize them as shocks, okay? If we were talking about this in economic terms, we would probably call them shocks, okay? So you might, you might call that during uh, that um, today. So planned and unplanned, okay? Now there are things that the business is going to plan to do, okay? They're going maybe part of their, their vision, okay? Vision statement, their mission objectives, okay? Is that they are going to introduce some new things, be it new management structure or something like that, okay? And if you're going to do that, then you're going to plan ahead and make sure that you're everything in place to go through this planned change. However, there are some shocks out there that the a business has little or no time to sort of really make any um, conscious plans about it. OK, so, um, you know, if we go back to the start of the year when it was back in the 1st of January 2022, OK, well, a lot of business wouldn't have planned for the fact there would be um, a war in Ukraine and the influence that's going to maybe have upon their supply chain. OK, they wouldn't have maybe guessed that what the impact it would have had on petrol and diesel prices. OK, so. You know, there's a lot of things that come up that you you know you you can't really plan ahead for because you're not really sure you know because things sort of pop up all the time. Could even be um, you know a natural disaster, okay, like adverse weather, um, like a hurricane or something like that, okay. So these are some examples, okay. Planned change, okay. Well, UK leaving the EU after the Brexit vote, okay, that could have been could have been maybe unplanned because it wasn't particularly expected that that would happen. OK, all right. Um, but, you know, there was a sufficient time to maybe plan ahead. OK, releasing new products. OK, you should be maybe aware of what your competitors are doing or whatever. OK, um, new new boss, new CEO or new laws. Now, you get, you're going to get plenty of time in advance when, before a government imposes new regulations, OK, for you to adapt. OK, but things that you can't plan ahead for, natural disasters, competitors start to start a price war, sudden Intra, uh, change in interest rates. OK, um, so we're seeing now with increasing um, inflation. OK, how are they going to react to that? Are they going to change interest rates? What, what, what are they what are they what are they going to do to counter this this inflation? OK, um, or a supplier goes bankrupt. OK, that you might not uh, have, 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 have bargained for that. OK, so how um, business can uh, be affected by change. Okay, it might have to change production methods, develop new products, meet these new legal requirements, get some new machinery in, retrain the workforce as a new technology coming in. Okay, look for new markets um, if new com if other competitors are doing something. Okay, now it's really important to manage change effectively because you have to try and maintain competitive. You have to main, remain that your costs remain low, so you're efficient. Okay, so you can remain productive and competitive. OK, uh, and make sure that your stakeholders are happy. Make sure there is no fall off in the amount of work that you're getting. and There's no fall off in the amount of dividends that your that your shareholders are getting. Now, John's story suggested four different approaches to how businesses could manage change. OK, now. Um, I worked at a school in Spain for a while, and when I was first employed by the school, it was run by um, someone independent. They were just they just owned the school. But then during my first year, while I was teaching there, um, it was bought by a global business called Cognita. And what they did is they, you know, it was quite clear with the changes that they're going to make. The school was going to expand, okay, massively, okay, um, but. They didn't really impose the changes upon us straight away. OK, it wasn't sort of they came in one day and then they bought a brand new site and they were going to just sort of change the whole school completely and, and, and imposed upon us. OK, it was done in bits. OK, and we had it was a real staged approach. This is what we're going to do after year one, year three, year five, year ten. This is the vision. OK, they introduced this to us, but there was also negotiation. We were we were we were key stakeholders as as employees of the business. We were allowed to sort of suggest, you know, discuss what was 
what the what the right way forward was okay whether we are actually listened to or not but we were definitely consulted upon by the school okay there's four different methods of when you are imposing change okay or or this facilitating change but, but if you want to use that language okay you can use the total impose package basically the leaders or the owners make all decisions and it's just sudden done right that's that's let's go okay that is it there's no consultation and that can maybe lead to demotivation the, the employees maybe don't know what the you know what you know where the where where things are going they might feel unsettled okay and might create a bit of a negative culture okay imposed piecemeal initiatives okay so basically the leaders take all decisions on what the business is going to look like what the change is going to be okay but they're going to do it step by step okay they're going to sort of do it like like the example i showed was year one year three year five year ten this is the very clear stages of how we're going to go about changing what we're doing in the business now you've got negotiated total packages okay where the, the change happens straight away but you have at least been in, you've at least been consulted as employees um, what uh, is going what how that is going to happen okay now employees will feel a little bit more uh, involved in that in that structure okay but um, you know quick change sometimes is difficult to manage negotiated piecemeal initiatives okay where it, what that is is basically similar where leaders and employees are consulted uh, you know employees are consulted on what the um, change is going to look like how it's going to um, be facilitated and they're going to do that in increments they're going to do it in stages okay now when there's resistance to change okay what's really important is that a business can communicate with their stakeholders and explain why they're going to why they're take, undertaking these changes okay um they've got to be able to maybe meet halfway and take some compromises and so on okay and that is really how you over, over overcome sort of a smooth transitional ch um, change within your business okay now people are always going to naturally resist change people don't want things that are different it's it's sort of it's 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 a name in into us okay so make sure you know if changes are done slowly and incrementally okay then a lot of staff will kind of come along with you. If it's very fast, they're going to feel like it's disruptive and going to demotivate them. OK, make sure your staff are educated and you're communicating to them why this change is happening. OK, and you might be more likely to get your employees um, on board and trusting you a lot more. OK, leadership in, 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 in during change can't really be kind of an autocratic style. OK, um, it's not going to um, it's not going to be good for maybe employee motivation okay it might be done quicker in an aut autocratic style but democratic leadership feels that people take a lot more ownership over the decisions that are being made okay so which if you're trying to manage change that could be um a way of doing it the other one is kurt lowen's three-step model of resistance to change okay so essentially what you've got is stage one is where you unfreeze things okay you undertake projects and have a project champion to sort of um think about how what the change is going to look like make and okay and then you move on to adapting those changes okay what you know you've, you've made some decisions in your project groups and so on you're now going to make those changes and then once those changes are in place you re refreeze it and that is the new structure the new culture whatever okay so how can we evaluate how successful change has been has sales revenue maintained or increased have you become more productive has there been minimal labor turnover okay in during during any period of change you're not going to please everybody and there's probably going to be some staff who leave or are disgruntled okay um so it's worth measuring you know uh, you know how many how many um how many staff have left um has it impacted how customers feel okay have you had to change your objectives what's your profits like have you has your market share been impacted okay are your is your market that you're you're operating in growing it growing okay so these are different ways that you can evaluate. The next section is risk management. OK, so it ties in quite nicely with um, this previous section. OK, um, so basically just goes about how businesses go about identifying risks. OK, um, how businesses go about avoiding risks um, between the difference between in, uh, insurable and uninsurable risks. OK, and what businesses can do to um, react to some of these risks. 
different kind of key terms, okay, quantifiable, compliance, insurance risk, contingency plan, scenario planning. Okay, we'll go through all these in terms. Okay, so what are some of the risks that businesses can see? We've touched upon a lot of those anyway. Okay, so it could be things like natural disasters, um, failure in equipment, uh, economic factors, which we'll touch upon probably next section, um, loss of staff, a PR disaster, okay, where, you know, there, there be, could be some negative articles out there about your, about your business, okay, maybe getting sued, supply problems, okay. So what is risk assessment? Okay, so what you want to do is you want to identify the risks, um, you want to analyse those risks, evaluate and prioritise. So what are the most likely risks to happen? Okay, and then contingency plan for all those different risks. Okay, so basically on this done, it's to identify what the risks are likely to be and to plan ahead. Now, some of the risks are insurable. OK, so let's say there is an earthquake or fire or natural disaster or you've crashed your car, OK, or crashed, um, um, crashed part one of your lorries or something like that, OK, or you've lost money, or you've been robbed or something. This is all stuff covered by insurance. Um, but then there are some uninsurable risks, OK? So basically, you, you're not, you can't be insured against rise inflation. You can't be insured against fluctuation exchange rate because that's the that's the nature of it, OK? Can't be insured against uh, like um, a war or something, OK? You can't be insured against new, new competitors, uh, you know, harming your business reputation, you know, anything along those lines, OK? Um, you can't really insure against uh, against those. OK, so what the business go about doing? OK, they undertake consistently pl con contingency planning. OK, so this if this happens, this is what's going to happen. OK, a lot of the larger business will undertake um, scenario planning, OK, where they get their managers to think about what might happen and how we how are we going to react to it. OK, um, crisis management. So responding to a significant threat to the business, OK, like damage limitation. This could be more of like a a PR disaster. OK, so how are people going to respond to something like that? And they, you know, they have procedures in place in order to react to that. OK, so types of crisis situations, financial problems, PR disasters, kind of thing we've talked about, technology not working, OK, natural disasters or or something negative that happens in the work, workplace. OK, use of contingency plans. OK, so just make sure you have plenty of just in case money. OK, there's all plenty of backup alternatives. So things like backup suppliers, if your suppliers is, is going to possibly go under as as a as, as one scenario that you plan for. OK, what's going to happen if there is a PR disaster? OK, it's important to remain calm, important not to sort of make any leaks to the press and so on. OK, and making sure that you've got plenty of staff that are trained to be multi-skilled okay and you can adapt to maybe losing a certain chunk of your workforce and you can and you can restructure it okay now there are some drawbacks of the time spent doing risk risk management okay is basically in a very dynamic or always changing market okay you're basically gonna have to be constantly updating your um contingency plans and your scenario management okay um and that could potentially be taking time away that could be more efficiently used elsewhere okay so you've got to weigh up really whether it's worth investing this time and this effort into um risk management uh, contingency planning or is your basis that whole opportunity costing could you be spending your money better elsewhere or spending your time much um better elsewhere okay and it'll also, it'll also depend on basically how good the backup plan is okay you can plan 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 but if the backup plan is rubbish then it's irrelevant whether you spend that time on it or not okay all right so we're real sort of hammering through this now. OK, so we're moving on to pest factors. OK, political, economic, social, technological. OK, and I will look at all these in turn. OK, all right. So um, I should have probably done it in alphabetical order, but unfortunately I haven't. OK, um, we're going to make a start on economics. OK. So um, 
what we're looking at in this section is how economic factors uh, impact businesses. OK, we're going to make sure we know some of the key terms and understand, make sure we understand the business cycle, OK, because we probably haven't done that. We touch upon it. I, I know I taught my class it in unit three, OK, but you probably haven't had a look at it since maybe GCSE or early on doing your, your ASs. OK. All right, so we're looking at changes in economic uh, environment on this one. OK, now. Right. OK, so what are the changes in the economic environment we can we have to um, consider the economic cycle, the business cycle, OK, measured by GDP, and we'll go through that in a little while. Exchange rates, OK, which is your currency and uh, valued in the currency of another currency. Interest rates, we'll talk about that. Inflation, what that is, and unemployment as well, OK? So if we look at the economic cycle, OK, basically you, are, you would be hoping that your GDP would grow by about 2% per year, OK? But we know that that doesn't really happen in a smooth way. OK, so what we see is we see a bit of a cycle. OK, OK, where we if you follow um, the graph, OK, what we'll see is that. A boom is when the economy is doing well, but it's starting to overheat. OK, and you're starting to see far too much spending. OK, so if we look at some of government, the government priorities at this stage, OK, so any, go any government will have four key objectives, OK, basically to ensure that you have steady economic growth, OK, that you have low to steady inflation, OK, that you have, um, you know, low unemployment and you have something called balance of payments, OK. Now, balance of payments, I'm not going to concentrate too much on in this in this bit, OK, but essentially let's remember that what we're trying to do is encourage economic growth, low to steady inflation and making sure plenty of people can work, OK. So during a boom, basically what we're seeing is we're seeing um, high economic growth, OK, but that means there's there's. We're seeing economic growth, plenty of people are in work, but we're seeing high inflation, OK, because of sort of demand in in the market, it's far too many people are spending, so we need to address the issue surrounding that, OK, so, in, so not enough. So too, too much inflation is a problem during a boom. OK, so we do some things in order to counteract that. OK, and we'll talk about that at the end. So what you might see straight after a boom is recession and downturn because of some of the decisions that that governments make. Now, we know that um, it's always going to be booms, there's going to be slumps. OK, what you want as a government is to manage those booms and slumps as effectively as possible. OK, so basically we're trying to grow our economy by, by about 2% per year, but we're not we're not trying to create too much fluctuations because that creates um, an unsteady business environment. If you can kind of only boom, you know, overheat a little bit and then the slump isn't isn't too low. OK, so what you don't want is sort of high bits and low bits of your economic cycle. OK, so because the government will manage the the economy, you'll always see a recession or a downturn. OK, and what you see is the bottom end, OK, the slump. OK, so that's referred to as the trough. OK, so if you look at that, maybe look like what a what a pig might eat out of, which is why we call it a trough. OK, and what we see here is that economic growth is is low or slow. You've got to see a lot more people out of work, particularly kind of cyclical unemployment like retail and stuff like that. OK, and you're seeing um, low infl low inflation, OK, probably below the 2% target. You might even see periods of deflation during a slump. OK, and then um, hopefully they're going to influence the economy in the correct way and you start to see a recovery or an upturn. OK, now what do we do to try and counteract the boom where there's far too much spending? OK, and what do we do to the economy when there's a slump, when there's not enough spending? We've got to encourage people to spend. OK, so. We have two key um, key elements. OK, of what a government does to a certain extent is what I mean. OK, so the first one that they have quite an influence over is um, is a fiscal policy. OK, fiscal OK is the use of taxation and government spending to influence an economy. OK, so during a boom, you can use that to discourage spending. 
OK, um, so what you can do is if you want to have people to have less disposable income, what you can do is you can increase your level of taxes. OK, so you can increase your income tax, corporation tax, because that'll discourage businesses from expanding. OK, and what you can do is you can also cut government spending. Now, in any given economy, the government is always the largest spender. OK, in America, OK, you might you've got these huge companies like Apple, Walmart or whatever. The U US government outspends them all. So if the government decides they're going to um, spend a little less, it has this impact upon the economy. OK, it starts to, um, you know, it can sh and shrink it. OK, um, so I'll give you an example. So maybe in your local town or whatever, they decide they're, um, they're going to Let's say what they're going to do. They're going to cut teacher numbers. OK, in, in your lo in your local school, they're going to cut teacher numbers. All right. So some students, some teachers are made redundant. They get rid of some TAs, a receptionist. OK, uh, maybe some of the dinner ladies. And what that means is because they're cutting back those teachers, those TAs, those receptionists, those um, canteen staff. Now we're not earning money, so they don't have this impact to go out and spend in their economy. So this creates the economy to shrink. OK, so basically you've got people with less money to spend because taxes have gone up. OK, and you've also got people with less money to spend because people don't have the wages go out and spend. Now, one person's one person's spending is another person's wages. So if you've not got people going out and spending money, basically you've got no wages for some people. OK. Um, so that's what you do with um, fiscal policy when it's a boom. OK, now the other aspect that we have is monetary policy. Now, the government don't have direct influence over this in England. OK, is the well in Britain is the Bank of England. OK, or in um, Europe, it's the European Central Bank based in Frankfurt or it's the Federal Reserve in the USA. OK, now they have an influence upon what the base interest rate is. OK, now interest rates are and we'll touch upon them again later. OK, but interest rates essentially is your reward for saving and your punishment for borrowing. OK, so if you um, if you want to discourage people from spending, which is what you're trying to do in a boom, you put up your interest rates, OK, because it's going to mean that people aren't going to want to um, take loans. Business aren't going to want to take out loans to um, to expand or take on more staff. OK, you're also encouraging people to leave money in their bank account because the interest rate is high and they get rewarded for doing so. So if you want to shrink your economy, OK, you want to contract it. OK, what you want, you want to do three things, increase taxes, decrease government spending, increase interest rates. OK, and that will stop people from spending too much. During a slump, you want to do the opposite. You want to encourage people to spend. OK, so what you want to do is you want to cut taxes so people have more um, disposable income to, to use. OK, you want to increase government spending. OK, you want to um, get people out there working. So maybe during a slump would be a good idea to maybe build a new hospital in your local town, because what that is, it has this expansionary impact, doesn't it? OK, so if you are building a new hospital and government are paying for it, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to pay some local guy to um, to rent the sort of the diggers and stuff from. You have to pay local builders. You have to fill it with doctors, nurses, porters, receptionists canteen staff, whatever. OK, and now these are people who are out of work and we're now in work and have wages go out and spend in the local community. OK, and those wages are being spent. OK, and one person's spending is another person's wages and so on. OK, so it has this expansionary impact. So if you're trying to get your economy to expand, OK, you want to cut taxes. OK, you want to increase government spending. And you also want to decrease interest rates. OK, because what that does is it encourages people and businesses to take out loans, OK, to do, to spend or to expand your business. OK, also discourages you from leaving your money in your bank account. OK, so um, that's um, um, that's basically sort of rundown of sort of, of all of this, really. OK, all right. Um, now, for how this impacts businesses. OK, if you're a lot, any business needs to be aware of where they are in the economic cycle. OK, because what you what you see is if you were to plot, for example, the rate of unemployment on this chart. Now, what you would see is a basically identical chart. All right, where. 
where unemployment kind of follows it about 12 months lags because basically people do not have an understanding of this economic cycle okay so after a after a boom okay and you start to see recession you actually start to see employment kind of rise a little bit before it drops off um because people think that it's just a temporary blip and people aren't going out and spending okay i'll pick up soon it'll be christmas blah blah blah, blah. okay um you know so you start to see that unemployment unemployment is slow to react and it's because businesses are slow to react they don't essentially have a basic understanding of really some gcse level economics of we need to recognize when it's periods of booms and slumps and so on okay and you should be able to react and, and adjust accordingly and this would minimize the risk or any problems that are likely to come up okay um so let's talk talk a little bit unemployment okay so uh, essentially there is ones we talked about is going to be cyclical so based upon the economic cycle okay um you've got things like seasonal unemployment okay so you start to see unemployment at certain parts of the year and so on okay inflation okay well that was mentioned before okay but essentially inflation is the general rising of prices and we're starting to see that now because of the rise in living costs okay you start to see because um petrol prices are going up you start to see uh, electric and gas prices going up okay um that this means that the cost of living is going up okay so inflation can be it's quite um you well you're not not unique in kind of inflation but it's not the typical kind of inflation that we see okay inflation can be um created by various factors okay all right so um it can be caused by things like demand pull okay so essentially during, during a boom you start to see inflation because you start to see an increased demand for your goods and services okay um now the best way i always describe it to my class okay so let's say i've got 15 students and i've got an apple tree and i've got 10 apples on my apple tree okay as i start to sell my apples for one pound a pop okay so sell them to everyone so the first five i sell them to for a pound okay but then resources are starting to um run out here okay so what i do okay well i've still got five apples and I've, but i've got 10 people essentially that want to buy it okay so i can now start to charge a little bit more for the ones that are left okay and essentially with inflation as well um suppliers can be greedy businesses can be greedy they're starting to see that people are earning a little bit more happy to go out and spending so they're just going to put up the prices okay cost push inflation where the cost of production okay causes prices to rise okay so what you're seeing now is probably cost push okay where you start because businesses are having to pay for increased petrol prices in transport and producing their goods okay and they're also paying more in um gas and electric in their factories making it okay well most businesses are not going to absorb those costs they're going to pass that on to consumers and you are and that has been reflected in the prices of the goods that are going up okay all right um one thing i didn't touch upon is how inflation is measured okay so it's done by the consumer price index okay and it basically takes an average basket of goods okay uh, and weigh it based on its importance to uh, to general general spending. Okay, now with the CPI, it doesn't represent housing costs. Okay, um, but there is something called the RPI. Okay, um, or sometimes it's called the CPIH, where they take into account the uh, the mortgage and the housing costs too. Okay, but essentially, what you need to know is inflation is measured by the CPI. You've come across index numbers during uh, Unit Three, so you should know them. Okay, um, so that is inflation. Okay um then you've we'll, we'll sort of touch again back upon monetary policy and interest rates just so we're real clear on it okay so this has been the um interest rate um over the last well 15 years coming up to now okay now what you will see back in 2008 2009 okay interest rates were quite high okay now you could say that during this period there was some some inflation people were doing very well okay i actually um took out a mortgage in sort of early 2009 or late 2008 okay and my interest rates 
that I was paying on my mortgage was about 6%, okay? But then not long after that, okay, interest rates severely dropped off and have remained low ever since, okay? So in 2009, the, there was the, the crash, the economic crisis, okay, House, housing bubble, whatever you want to call it, okay? And you start to see a lot of economies across, um, across the world because economies are now interconnected, um, they were real struggling, okay? So in order to sort of, you know, well, a lot of people were, you know, at a lot of people were struggling, weren't able to go out and spend. So to encourage spending, what they did was they dropped interest rates to 0 0.5, 0 0.25. And what the point of that was, was to encourage people to, um, to borrow money, buy houses and so on, okay? So interest rates have remained really low um, ever since, okay? Whether that is going to rise now, Okay, we're in, we're, in a, we're in a difficult stage where we're trying to manage inflation, really. But if we rise interest, if we increase interest rates, that's probably going to impact mortgage costs, and people are already squeezed enough. Okay, so it's interesting to sort of, if you know, if you're interested in this kind of thing like I am, it's it's going to be quite interesting to see what they're going to do forward. I haven't really mined into the um, the budget that was announced by Rishi Sunak today. I know little bits of it. OK, um, he, he's kind of concentrated a bit more on addressing the, um, you know, the cost of living crisis as opposed to maybe addressing some aspects of inflation. And that's what's important to remember with these government economic objectives. I talk about economic growth, low inflation, um, low unemployment, is that at various stages, things will become more important or less important for um, for business, for governments, okay? And certain governments will have um, different priorities, okay? So, you know, you know, I know, for example, in Britain, they probably want to concentrate more on making sure there is low unemployment, okay? Whereas uh, in Spain, where I used to live, okay, their main priority is more on economic growth, okay? Right. Um, OK, so exchange rates. OK, so rates are the price of one currency in terms of another. OK, and how that influences it. OK, and this has a big influence upon the fourth government economic objective that I mentioned before, which was your balance of payments. OK, because what we're talking about here is the import and exports aspect. OK, now. Look at the next slide. OK, so if we live in the UK and we deal in the, the pound, OK, now, um, if there is a weak pound, OK, that can benefit certain uh, certain businesses. If you are uh, an exporter, OK, um, having a weak pound means that the value of our goods seem cheaper um, to the countries abroad. OK, so I'll give an example here. China likes to keep their currency low. They like to keep it weak, OK, so that we end up buying a lot of Chinese goods. So. If I ask you to look around your house now or the clothes you're wearing, it might say made in China. OK, and that's because they like to be able to export abroad. So they keep their currency relatively low. OK, um, and in the same. Um, sort of on the and but obviously for um, if there is a, a weak, a weak pound, OK, um, imports are down, OK, because goods from abroad seem more expensive. So cheese from France, wine from wine from Spain, uh, ham from Italy or cars from Japan. These seem more expensive and are less likely to be imported in. OK, so a weak pound can kind of maybe encourage some domestic consumption. So if you look at China, for example, again. OK, is that China, their uh, their currency is, is weak, so they export a lot and they actually consume a lot of of and Chinese people actually consume a lot of Chinese goods. That, there's a slight political element to that, but it kind of colours my point a little bit. Right. On the flip side of that, you've got um, you've got a, a strong pound. If there's a strong pound, OK, it means that your exports are less attractive, OK, because your goods seem more expensive um, to foreigners than um, to or foreign, foreign buyers or foreign companies. OK, so they're more likely to go somewhere where their currency is weak. So it seems um, um, seems cheaper. However, on the other side of that, for us as consumers, we live in a country where the currency is relatively strong compared to globally. 
okay um so that means a lot of the goods that we buy from abroad do seem do seem a lot cheaper okay now what are we talking about here with all of this okay now with the business cycle okay um we like i said to you, you want to try and keep it that it's not creating too much risk or too much change or too many problems you don't want too high of a peak and too low of a slump okay um, you want to try and have as much of a settled uh, business environment as possible. So it allows businesses to scenario plan and contingency plan that they kind of know what it was like two years ago to what it's like now. OK, because if you're seeing a lot of change, you're seeing high rates of inflation, you're seeing interest rates completely being always being meddled, meddled with tax rates going up and down and and so on. It's very difficult for business to plan ahead. OK, so you want as settled a business environment for your for your country as possible. OK, so that finishes off the economic element. So next lesson, we want to political. OK, and then we'll finish off um, the rest of unit four um, next week. Thanks for tuning in, guys. OK. Um, I will see you next week for our final session.